Not exactly. Mm-hmm. I think of the thulacine, um, the the as um, as simultaneously about past, present, and what is to come. I think of the of the thulucine as the earthly ones, the dreadful ones, the um, the processes and uh, and beings of earthly worlding, that and that the phonic ones are in the uh, mythology of the moderns, always relegated to the past, mm-hmm. to the traditional, to that which uh, is in the domain of mythology, uh, perhaps to the domain of the, um, the snaky-faced female who freezes mankind and whose head must be chopped off mm-hmm. by the head-born daughter of Zeus and placed on her shield as the sign of the conquering of the Olympiad the conquering heroes. The Thulucine is relegated to that which is always already defeated. Mm. And I think the argument I'm making is that the Thulucine is, is not already defeated. That the Thulucine is um, a thick kind of ongoingness at stake. Mm. And within the Thulucine we are at stake to each other. That it's not finished. This is not game over. And there's a way in which the mythology of the Anthropocene, figured as it is on the Anthropos, that tragic figure whose grand projects end in tragic detumescence that brings the world to an end in its secularized sacred form. That the Anthropocene, that figure of final secular tragedy, um, is an appalling story with which to approach the urgencies of the multiple endings of worlds and ongoings and spiting of endings, the kinds of things that Eduardo and Deborah wrote about in their La Rête du Monde, um, that, the, uh, that the world is always already ended for multiple critters, human and non-human, and in ferocious kinds of apocalypses and genocides, uh, which in North and, North and Latin America one knows in the flesh of one's being. How could I be the, the white girl of, of, uh, in, in a place like California and not understand the territory of conquest and genocide in which this very conversation takes place, literally? Like my computer is sitting on conquest and end. <laughs> mm. uh, the multiple endings of worlds that have always already ended. The Thulucine is about, um, it's not a pro-life figure. It's not about embracing life over death. It's not about embracing transcendence. It's about embracing the snaky ongoingness of, of earthly worlding in its past, presence, and futures that, it, that in some sense snakes in and through these other two big stories, the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, uh, the various epochs for naming worldings that are simultaneously too big and not big enough for the um, ongoingness and, ex- and precariousness of, of life on the, uh, living and dying well on this earth. So I think of the Thulucine as one of a, of a, a, a litter, of, as a big enough story for doing some of the work that I feel needs to be done in the grip of the dreadful ones, in the grip of the tentacular ones, who are of always of and under the waters and the earths. These are not the sky-looking ones. Mm. So I don't think of the Thulucine as an answer to the Anthropocene so much, or to the Capitalocene. I think those two figurations and storytelling apparatuses, um, willy-nilly and whether I wanted it, what I, I think those two figurations and storytelling apparatuses have work to do. And they are, whether I like it or not, um, the, the multiple understandings of capital and the multiple understandings of the Anthropocene remain a critical part of what I and we need to engage. Um, that said, I, uh, as I think I said in my paper, if we could have only one word for the, um, uh, te- the, the dreadful intrusions among us, uh, that, that threaten life on earth, not just for human beings, but for um, vast numbers of, of plants and animals and ways of, ways of living on this earth. 
It would be Capitalocene and not Anthropocene. Not because it tells the whole story, because it, but because the Anthropos didn't do this thing. Um, processes of worlding in extraction, the massive um, production of wealth out of extraction in the genocides and labor systems and slaveries and industrializations and energy apparatuses and, 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 of something I may as well, we may as well call the Capitalocene. Is, the, is much more the name of the story than a supposed species act that the Anthropocene uh, calls forth in, uh, inevitably. It makes it seem like what's happening is a species act. I think that's true. I, I think that, um, I, first of all, I think storytelling is an incredibly powerful thing to be doing now for somehow collecting up the human and non-human peoples into some kind of uh, some kind of living well now, whether it works or not, to solve some sort of sense of problems. It's that kind of insistence in joy and terror on living and dying well on this earth. Mm. Uh, I think that also gives us the best possible chance, chance of ongoingness. Mm. But I think it makes us the most powerful resistors to the systems of domination that are so uh, abundantly present and powerful. And so that kind of storytelling that collects up peoples, human and non-human, into um, both imagined and enacted ongoing, uh, mm -hmm. really matter to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think of the Thulu scene as a, as a storytelling um, proposition, mm -hmm. as a uh, here's a story, who will inhabit this one? We know something about who inhabits the story of the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene. I think there is tremendously important critical work to be doing, to be done within the frame of the Capitalocene, a kind of ongoing critique of the apparatuses of, of the production of a certain kind of wealth and its extraction and distribution. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that work is by any means finished. Mm -hmm. um, and I am willing to inhabit the apparatus of the Anthropocene in the way a geophysical union would because the capitalism is an impossible word for them. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, they can't speak it without dying of apoplexy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but they can speak about really important matters that call people to attention. So I, I'm not a purist here. Mm -hmm. But the Thulocene is something else entirely. In my, uh, so truly something else, not entirely, but it, it is another kind of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. It is an invitation to inhabit a becoming with, to, as Vincent Desprez would say, a rendering each other capable. Mm -hmm. The cultivation of response ability, not response ability as a list of ethical or political uh, obligations. It's not you know, be responsible. It is rather cultivate the capacity to respond and cultivate the capacity to respond in the, in the temporal and spatial and in the depth of it all. Hmm. So that the Thulucene is, it's among other things, it, it's way bigger than the Greeks. It's uh -huh. way bigger than the Mesopotamians. Uh -huh. It certainly links over into uh, uh, ancient uh, subcontinental Asian worlds. It ties to the Naga goddesses of the, of the seas around what we now know of as Indonesia. It ties to the snake goddess dance today in Java as uh, Ratu, uh, what's her name, um, Ratu Kidur, Rata Kidur, that uh, Raisa uh, Dismet taught me about in a dissertation she wrote recently. It tracks into continuities that are very much now. I, I, it is important to me that the word seen um, means a, a, a thick present epoch of now. It doesn't just mean the past. The thick present epoch of now has many durations to it. It has many kinds of, of um, livings and dyings in it. Uh, and yes, the, the um, multiple livings and dyings of kinds on this earth, some of which, of course, are compressed in great heat and pressure into the pools of, of, the, of oil or into the, the thick substances of the tar sands mm -hmm. that are sucked out in the third great age of capital to make new fast, uh, to burn, so to make new fossils as, pass, as fast as possible by burning old fossils. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fossil making man is the anthropos or the, is the, uh, those who would extract the tar sands. Mm -hmm. 
But in a context that I'm calling Thulucine, um, the 20 different peoples that inhabit northern Alberta, where the tar sands are being extracted, linked in all sorts of ways, little and big, uh, struggling for the control of the lands and the waters and the places of northern Alberta, which is, after all, after Saudi Arabia um, and one other place, you know, the, the biggest oil deposit on this planet. Yeah. These struggles for what is under the earth and on the earth in an area of land that is, among other things, normally covered by lichens. Mm -hmm. If you move uh, the, the thin crust are so important to the caribou and the reindeer, right? The lichen yeah. eaters. Yeah. The herbivores who are lichen eaters. And lichens themselves are symbiotic organisms. They, they are never just a one. So they recall to us in the substance of being one, you are always already at least two. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that to be a one is to become with many. Uh, that this is the, the normality of becoming with in something called the Thulucine. So it's not Lovecraft's Thulu uh -huh, scene, which uh -huh. is a patriarchal uh, uh -huh. uh, Thulu. It's a, sure. a dreadful patriarchal god, I but know, it's the Thulu scene of the Naga goddess, uh -huh. the snake swimming, you know, the snake swimming in the seas above Australia, between Australia and Indonesia, and mm -hmm. it's the it's the multiple sneakiness. We need we need to make much more trouble than we know. Yes. How, uh, this we this ever composing and decomposing this this both real and also luring we that can that these ways that work that being at stake to each other we can become with each other to make the kind of trouble that makes it possible both to live now and to have in the future a kind of ongoingness that is more just not less just. Uh, and that is multi-species, including human beings, on the same side. Mm -hmm. um, in, so that um, Emma Goldman is my one of my uh, you know heroes, among other things, because she's such a, an earthy figure. She's kind of an Ursula Le Guin figure of the left, if you will. She's mm -hmm. she's an anarchist after all, not yeah. particularly respectable. Yeah. You know, she's going to wail about with her handbag, you know, that's full of books to read in jail. Uh, she she's a birth control activist, you know, way before anything. You know, she she actually cares about the the well-being of those who you know, of women and children who give birth, and she prioritizes things like birth control uh, at a moment when the heroic left didn't want to hear anything about it. Uh, Emma Goldman is a, is a um, a strong woman who continues to uh, you know be, she continues to inform us and to infuse us. Um, and she, like uh, Isabel Stangers, and like the Gecko Group in, in Brussels, and, and like many of our, our allies, mm -hmm. um, think we must, we must think. Uh, this is not about reason, as we're not worrying yet once again whether there's something called humanity out of some kind of worrying about the nature of freedom and the lineage of great male philosophers. That, that's sort of interesting sometimes, mm -hmm. but it, it's not the discussion I'm interested in. I'm interested in the kind of um, thinking, uh, how, how do we think truly? How do we inherit and think with each other so as not to be thoughtless the way Eichmann was thoughtless in Hannah Arendt's accusation? Mm. Hannah Arendt wants us to learn how to, uh, she thinks of thinking as training ourselves to going visiting. Mm. You know, that thinking is an operation of learning how to go visiting. To learning how to not be oneself in, in a certain sense of self-preoccupied, but somehow being open to consequences, to caring about to caring about the world, not business as usual. In, in the feminisms that I grew up in in 1960s, 70s mainly, mm -hmm. there was a phrase: the last thing in the world we need is downward mobility of the mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. We uh, what you know seriously what the people of this earth need is thinking strong thinking and strong alignment with each other and that's a materialist practice. Mm -hmm. It's a practice that can only happen in situated struggles uh, and those situated struggles can happen on paper. It's not like they have to happen in some kind of imaginary street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although mm -hmm. getting out on the street is not a bad idea. Perhaps uh, I think of revolution as um, the, the 
the change, a true changing of uh, the changing of the story, not in some kind of great apotheosis of the freedom of mankind or Absolutely. whatever. Yes. Yes. But uh, in storying, we change the stories. Um, and revolution is a small and large at the same time. Yes, yes, and uh, I I remember how you remember when you when you especially when we're younger when we read a big book that that is that is full of ideas that maybe everybody else already knows but I didn't. <laughs> I remember the first time I understood that the critical theorists of the Frankfurt tradition um, that taught that the established disorder is not necessary. Such a simple thing. Uh, I think resistance is the is holding in one's um, holding present to oneself and to us that the established disorder is not necessary. The real is real, but it truly does not have to be that way. And it did not have to be that way. It is the result of contingencies, and it can be undone uh, by working the contingencies. That we work in contingency um, with skill. It's not like we control the outcome or something, but no more did the, uh, the world that we have, we have, but it actually didn't have to happen that way. I think remembering that is an important kind of opening into, nor does it have to continue this way. And the losses among us um, are real. That uh, mourning, uh, uh, that kind of mourning the dead, um, and mourning the failures, and mourning that which has been destroyed and will not be fixed, and the onrushing fact that a great deal will still be happening that is not fixable. Something like 50% of the species of the birds in this planet probably won't make it through this century, maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, the destruction of peoples uh, with uh, all of it takes to do their peoplehood, both human and non-human, um, is, uh, is uh, in train. I think uh, a kind of a facile imagining that somehow uh, there's some kind of future to come where that won't be anymore, or, somehow things can be reversed in that sense of reversal is wrong. Uh, and that the only possibility for living with joy and terror includes mourning, includes an understanding that we are not pro-life storytellers. We are about living and dying and taking on. We're about uh, bearing with. That kind of suffering is a notion of bearing, carrying. Uh, and that this is not a depressing um, that with each other, this is not about um, cynicism or skepticism or depression. It's about being serious. Uh, and in that seriousness, there's just an extraordinary kind of joy. I need, beautiful, I need the beauty of theory, which takes us up into being able to go on. Um, that kind of thing. So resistance, I mean, there are many kinds of resistance. Uh, there's the resistance of the hegemony of Monsanto in agriculture, in monocrop agriculture in the Midwest of the United States. There's certain very specific kinds of obligations to resistance. Mm -hmm. But then there's also that sense of resistance as the refusal, uh, I think Isabel and Phil, uh, uh, Philippe Pignar in their Sorcery of Capitalism, mm -hmm. not to be, uh, sorcelle, not to be, um, uh, bewitched by the, uh, to not be bewitched by the, uh, the sense of the totality and the inescapability of capital C capital and capital A Anthropocene, not to be bewitched mm -hmm. into, uh, into what? Into complete nothingness. Um, that rather we need the kinds of witches that Isabel embraces in the ecology of practices that kind of ritualization of, li of, uh, of rendering each other capable of living and dying well. Exactly. And you know the, the, the serious joke that my partner Rustin gave me, that uh, it's not human, it's humus. Mm. And it's not humanities, oh, yes. it's humusities. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, yeah. And that uh, to be human is always already to be 
compost. Mm -hmm. Not oh, that, and that, oh, yeah, uh, that we, uh, as we both live and imagine presents, and, you know, past, presents, and futures. It's oh. as compost, mm -hmm. not as not within posthumanism. Mm -hmm. um, that is the humusities, the humusities, etc. Uh, and that insists that already in the word human, in fact, there is the the the, um, the becoming withness. The not human as a uh, uh, bounded, autopoetic, self-making, and tragic species. It's not the autopoetic, self-making, tragic human. It's the sympoesis. It's the making with all the way down. Mm -hmm. uh, snaky mm -hmm. making with. So that even the word human, uh, is we mishear it. Mm -hmm. I actually think the word anthropos is irredeemable. Uh, the etymology of anthropos is... is uh, uh, seriously in the way. Even scholars who attempt to translate Biblical Greek have trouble with it because the word can't include slaves or women or children. The word, the word uh, homo is actually uh, rather more malleable. It goes to humus very quickly and then goes to guman, the, the one who works the earth, and the adama. It goes to Hebrew uh, in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and adama need not be configured as the, the masculine Adam, but can be configured as those of the earth, those who live and work the earth. Um, that's a feminist statement about Adam, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. But so, so yes, the um, and the word species itself, um, in its contemporary workings by the best biologists, in my view, um, is always already full of um, the species. Co the species are never one. That that it is it, that far from being an exception, lichens are. Lichens and coral, coral figure symbiosis, as if they are the exceptions that figure symbiosis when the norm is the development of, multi of individuals in reproductive continuities, mm -hmm. uh, in tree-like continuities of reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and the more uh, contemporary biologists look at the, at the nature of living entities on this earth, that just isn't true. Um, certainly microbiome research, which is big, is an immense part of this. But it, I think, when I say in my most recent, the paper that's still in draft, that at some really serious level, the tools to think methodological individualism are no longer available. Yeah, that's just that they yeah. are literally, technically, unthinkable mm -hmm. if one is to, to attempt a description of the ongoing processes of living and dying on this earth. Which does not mean that it's all boundaryless and everything is just some one yeah. big game, just one blah blah at all. It right. means boundaries are in fact very important, and what it costs to maintain some boundaries rather than others is a very important consideration. And but it does mean uh, that we uh, do not work with interrelationality. And Karen Barad, I think, has been our mo our clearest theorist of in of in tra relationality uh -huh. and that and Bruno too has talked about the way that entities are the result of processes of engagement not their prior you know enter into relationship entities are the consequence of in, of uh, mm -hmm. engagements of, of many kinds and the situated kinds really matter so uh, it, it's really an imperative to pay attention to this to well the specificities you know mm -hmm. something of a joke to use that word you know. I love Gifford, uh, Bruno's Gifford lectures. I, th I think what he's doing, I read and reread it, I think it's really important. But when he goes to the trials of strength, trials of strength, mm -hmm. and the war of the earth bound with the human, so the terrien with the, the, the human, yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that uh, it's not like I don't think wars need to be fought, heaven only, I mean, or it's not like I think war is somehow. Uh, that we are somehow exempt from the problem of engagement in war. I wish we were, but we're not. But I think the stories that are available to us and are real and are ongoing now and need to be made bigger are not the stories of trials of strength. Enough already. Uh, for example, uh, the trials of strength approach, the, the, the dramaturgy of trials of strength, mm -hmm. Uh, let's take the struggle over the tar sands in uh, in Al in northern Alberta and the Keystone Pipeline and the the whole question of what Michael Clare calls the third age of carbon, the race to extract the last calorie of fossil fuel before the Russians get it or the 
or the you know, Norwegians get it, or the Americans get it, you know, the, the race, the un, extremely highly capitalized race to extract the last calorie fossil fuel from this earth um, that's going on as we speak. Okay? Mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, there is a, an extraordinary struggle going on here. Uh, and uh, the notion of war is, is perhaps, small w, yeah? <laughs> an important one for this struggle. Um, uh, legal and illegal strategies for this struggle, all kinds of things. But if we are also seri about, serious about alignment and tentacular knotting and the, the cleverness of the cuttlefish who secretes the ink into the dark sea to hide itself in its trajectories, we seek allies, I think, also in the oil companies, among the engineers on the oil fields. Um, in the, uh, we, we seek allies in unlikely places. We, we, we work for alignments in the belly of the monster. And if we are too intent on the dramaturgy of uh, the, the humans and Italians, we stop seeking allies in the belly of the monster. We stop living in the monster. We stop living in the Thulucine, mm. um, in the snaky, dangerous, dreadful zone. Uh, because I think we need to be making allies with the enemy, um, he, uh, and we don't know how. Uh, mm. And I, the imaginations of somehow inhabiting the belly of the monster, um, you know, I, I, Eduardo, your work, and, and Deborah, your work, the, the, the way you have worked in Brazil, mm. uh, and in the ways that the Amerindians have had to inhabit the belly of the monster, Sure. and form yeah. un unlikely alliances yeah. um, and become somebody they had no intention of becoming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these, these sorts of reworldings and reworkings, I think, need to be engaged in other dramaturgies than that of war, mm. uh, precisely because the, uh, we are in the belly of the monster. Well, I'm trying to respond to this as, uh, in as many ways as I can, and here are some of them. Um, the, um, one of them is to simply say something, uh, is to say, look, I'm not talking about any kind of status apparatus here. I'm not talking about invoking uh, some kind of uh, uh, coercive apparatus of, 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 of the state or of uh, some kind of puritanical improvement movement of, uh, at all, I'm, uh, but let's for a moment take on um, the fact um, that like, like climate, climate uh, change, like global warming and many other, uh, and, multi, and uh, the unrushing of extinctions and the, the increased immiseration of uh, numbers of people on this planet in conditions of, of uh, intensified extraction, and so, like these things truly are not up for discussion. These are truly facts, and I know there are deniers, mm. um, but we are not they. And I actually think this question of the peopling of the earth is like that. That uh, in my lifetime, it's moved from about two billion to seven plus billion, and before I die, if I live out my actuarial uh, <laughs> life, because I'm a rich white woman in, the, in, a, in a very rich part of the world, so, uh, and lots of money is going to be spent to keep me alive as an old white lady for a really long time. Uh, therefore, by the time I die, most likely, from an actuarial point of view, uh, we will be well beyond 8 billion. And by the end of this century, if birth rates remain low, uh, we will top out between 10 and 11 billion on this planet, and then very slow, uh, and that's if, and only if. The birth rates on this planet, which actually now are quite low, almost everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, the low replacement rates in India, for example, mm -hmm. well, if and only if they remain low, will that be the scenario? This is uh, an urgency, this is an, an extraordinary urgency of uh, human beings uh, making way too many demands on this planet, and it is of course true that the wealthy make an extraordinary level of demands um, completely out of proportion. Uh, to the immiserated populations of this earth. That said, and of course the urgency is especially in the rich areas of the world and the rapidly enriching areas of the world, mm -hmm. such as China and India and Brazil mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. 
uh, where of course the great bulks of the population will remain immiserated, but which large populations will are becoming wealthy very rapidly, mm -hmm. uh, and with extraordinary consequences. Mm -hmm. So part of it is a, is a recitement of facts, is a recitation of the facticity of it all, okay? Um, and that uh, we need to be uh, talking about it, coming to terms with, thing, with it, recognizing that nobody has got the answers. And our failure to talk about this is like the Christians' failure to talk about climate change. It is the same thing. How do we make kin that's not based on ongoing making new babies? How do we adopt old people? How do we have at least five parents for every new baby? How do we how do we truly make relation make kin in a Marilyn Strathairn sense? How do we do kin making mm -hmm. uh, outside the apparatus of biological reproduction? Uh, so you in, we, one would obviously include the ongoing biological reproductive families and those who need to be taken in you know these are those are good things of the earth, but they should be very rare, not abundant. So I'm I'm continuing to um, talk about it, trying to enlist others in talking about it. Uh, feminist friends of mine who have said, how can you possibly be a feminist and talk like that? We sit down and talk to each other. Turns out they, um, we end up having a lot to share with each other. This is again about not doing trials of strength. It's about figuring how to listen in the face of quite different truths. It's true that, uh, that uh, you know, the apparatuses of population control have been imperialist apparatuses. They have also been apparatuses of women's liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, and to forget the one in order to foreground the other is not okay. Mm -hmm. These are really forbidden topics. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you, if you're going to stay with the trouble, you talk forbidden topics. Mm -hmm. And you laugh, and you recognize that this is a minefield, and you enlist your friends and your enemies to think together. And pretty soon, um, there's some stuff happening that's, uh, that nobody could have done alone. Yeah. We are always already lichens anyway. Uh, we are always already uh, a, a, an ontologically heterogeneous uh, composition. Um, and uh, that we ought to start paying attention to that uh, and um, storying it and uh, you know, learning how to do political theory with it, <laughs> learning how to, uh, you know, taking account of which pathogens for, you know, what happens to turn a pathogen from uh, a peaceful cohabitant to a raging uh, uh, epidemic? Why are we developing um, epidemic-friendly transnational animal, uh, animal agricultural systems? Mm -hmm. What is this zoonotic disease? We are developing, not only are we milking the earth dry of fossil fuels, we ha have developed apparatuses of species transfer uh, that are epidemic friendly with a vengeance. And this has been, of course, coextensive with the history of capital. Uh, the, the transportation of genomes, uh, oil palm, plantain, um, slaves, uh, microbes, uh, you know, drug stocks, uh, <laughs> the, the transportation of the generative stocks of the earth is the name of the game of the capitalist scene mm -hmm. and also the fuller scene. So why don't we start um, being better at, uh, it's not like this is some sort of new discovery. <laughs> These becoming with each other, uh, there is no point in being an entity on the, you don't have organisms plus environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have, the notion of, of an entity plus its environment is what we can't think anymore. Yes, we have what biologists are calling holobionts, the mm -hmm. uh, collection of entities taken together in their relationalities that construct a good enough one uh, to make more of itself or to, or to get through the day. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I return really to the, that, the kind of uh, urgency of staying with the trouble. Uh, and not and not in a repressive way. The, the, truly, the joy and the terror of it. Mm. And I am I am consumed by the danger of folks around us, including ourselves, feeling like it's all you know the damage is done. It's over. Nothing can happen. Mm. Uh, the the, um, the 
and uh, the, the, the need to tell the truth includes telling the ongoing inventiveness and opportunism and reworkings of worlding that produce flourishings old and new, returning to old ones as well as inventing new ones, not being made stupid by the notion that, you know, there's past, present, and future, and there's no ways of, of remake times. Um, I, I feel a kind of, a, of an upwelling of, um, not exactly hope, but of, the, of uh, a kind of power that, that we have the capacity to, we, we can render each other capable of living well on this planet. Um, and uh, something like the conference you're doing must somehow evoke that sense of ongoingness and not just the terrible sense of the degree of the trouble. <laughs> yeah, well, I, want that I, I actually, I'm something of a narcissist. I actually mistake <laughs> people beginning to say Thulucine. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> hey, if Sturmer and Kutzen could do it, why not us? <laughs> they, I mean, a diatom, freshwater biologist. I mean, hey, we're as good as that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We will spread okay. the word.